Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ionic's latest webinar, Reimagining Cordova, Building Cross-Platform Web Apps with Capacitor. My name is Matt Netko. I'm our Senior Product Evangelist at Ionic. Thanks for joining me today. Please feel free to stick around for the end. We have a really exciting guest today. Max Lynch, the CEO of Ionic, is going to be joining me for some Q&A. So as I'm going through this and our demo and slides and everything, the entire presentation, write down some questions. Feel free to put them in the sidebar there and the go to go to meeting kind of webinar thing, and um, we will get to as many as we can at the very end. Thank you. First, before we get to our exciting capacitor demo, it's important to start with a brief history of Cordova, the tool that we're bringing new life to and reimagining with capacitor. Cordova was created in 2008. There was a company, a team of web developers, that said to themselves, we really love using our web development skills. We really love the mobile platforms, especially iOS and Android. And we want to extend our skills and be able to build mobile apps with that technology. Is that possible? And they, and they said yes, and they figured it out. And what they ended up coming up with is what our diagram here uh, shows, is building a way to containerize and build a web app and wrap that in a native app shell. And while also really, really exciting even to this day, providing access to the native device hardware features such as the camera, device, geolocation, all those sort of functionalities exactly as and with the same capability as native apps and so how that looks is you, you use your normal HTML, CSS, and JavaScript skills as a web developer, along with any resources like images and splash screens, icons that are local and, and unique to the mobile platform. We add those and then have a config XML file that acts as our configuration for each different platform. And voila, we have ourselves a native app. And in 2013, they built a CLI. And the tooling continued to evolve from there and through many platforms that have come and gone as well, that leads us to 2018. And the, the many, many companies have been using Cordova and integrated it into their tooling and their applications. And it's by far the most stable option that you have today for a production ready type of app. And what they're up to today is ongoing, mostly minor updates. So it has, it's been chugging along for about 10 years now and has been an incredibly successful project. However, our native platforms love to move fast, right? Whether it's iOS, Android, or some of the others that are no longer with us or have been deprecated, things change as they do in any type of technology stack, um, whether it's programming languages or, in this case, native platforms. So the issue here is we, we typically see new operating system, new operating systems, new hardware every year, especially with iOS and Android. And over time, things have evolved. We have a new modern plugin system with CocoaPods on, on iOS and Gradle for Android and Android Studio, as well as more modern languages. We started with Objective-C in Java, and now we have the ability to use Swift for iOS and Kotlin on the Android side. And so all of us at Ionic thought, what if we created a spiritual successor to Cordova that used these modern native tools and the latest and greatest functionality and mindshare and ever, taking all the lessons that we learned from Cordova over the past 10 years? And we did that. And so I'm here to introduce Capacitor to you today. What is Capacitor exactly? Well, this is... Ionic's new cross-platform runtime. Very much like Cordova, again, it's built to run on as many platforms as possible and extremely future-friendly and future-focused as well. So we target iOS, Android, desktop, so Windows, Mac, Linux apps, as well as, of course, the web. That is our key mantra and something that we'll always be focused on, right? And Compared to Cordova, that was primarily mobile-focused, iOS and Android, and back in the day, Windows Phone and BlackBerry, we're thinking beyond that into desktop web apps, mobile web apps, and traditional desktop apps, even with Electron, and that's your 
different types of apps like Visual Studio Code and Slack, very popular apps today that are built on top of those type of technologies. One major lesson learned that we wanted to bring to Capacitor was being sure that we stayed close to the web browser standards and basically trying to avoid custom tooling that'll be brittle, um, hard to maintain, difficult to work with as developers. So the web focus APIs allow us to stay close to these standards because we're built on top of what the browser gives us, not going into different offshoots of technology that again are very difficult to, to maintain. And we're gonna see kind of what that looks like with our demo coming up here. The other main aspect of the project is what we're calling code once configure everywhere. So we're going to and are happy to embrace the modern native tooling that each platform gives us. So with Cordova, we used config XML that acted as an abstraction layer over iOS, Android, etc. And so that particular unique defined custom config file would be translated into different permissions and configuration for plugins, icons, splash screens, and everything. And as you might imagine, it, it, it can work really well, but at the same time, when something goes wrong, it's a little hard to debug because you have to map this additional layer of complexity onto that whatever native platform issues you're having, right? So by embracing the modern native tooling, what we mean with that is we are actually going back to and embracing Xcode for iOS or Android Studio for Android. And we'll kind of, I'm really excited to show that off in the demo because it, it, even myself coming from before my time at Ionic building hybrid apps with Cordova myself, the whole idea behind this approach is you're, you don't want to learn necessarily the native languages. You want to be able to reuse your web skills. And that's still the case here. Um, it's actually very intuitive and there's only a little bit of um, knowledge that we need to navigate these, these tools. So it's, uh, I think it works out really well. And the additional benefit is easier native project ma maintenance as well as being able to work, and probably the most exciting thing is being able to work with the native developers on our team. These are now, with Capacitor, first-class build artifacts. They are not wiped away on every build like they were with Cordova. Um, they are checked into source control. They are a part of your project. So if your team of web developers is building a, you know, the main portion of the app, and then maybe the native team needs to get involved for a custom plugin, or even just from debugging um, a native platform issue or something, they can do so and confidently and with much more ease than in the past. And perhaps not surprising, as I, as I mentioned, our inspiration comes from a bunch of different tools, including, of course, Cordova and React Native, TurboLinks, and many others. So we're bringing in lessons learned from all those platforms and tools over many, many years. So, all right, let's get to the demo. Very really excited about this. We're going to be integrating the camera, local notifications, and toast messages with the capacitor APIs and, and native plugins for iOS, Android, and the web. So bear with me for a second while I switch over to uh, the code. So before we get into the code, let's take a look at what we're going to be looking at here. This is the Ionic Conference app. Now, unfortunately, today we don't have a, an official Ionic Conference, but rather this is one of our, our main sample demo apps that are available for free, open source, on GitHub. And so I invite you to go check that out, and we'll have links for it at the end of the presentation today. And what it does is it mimics a real conference app with a schedule, speakers, and even integrated Google Maps to show where we are in the world. And what we're going to do today is we have the concept of a login logout me mechanism for user accounts. And they're not actually tied up to tied into a real back end, but that is something you could add on your own time. Once we log in here, we're going to remind the user to set their profile picture, which falls under the account page here. 
So we have everything in place. We have an update picture method that currently does nothing in the main demo, and we want to update our avatar here. So not only remind them via no a notification to do this, but actually use the camera across the web, iOS, and Android to provide one, use one code base with capacitor to provide this selfie type of functionality. So I'm excited, let's, let's do it. Okay, let's switch on over to Visual Studio Code and our terminal. And we're gonna start by installing capacitors. So just an NPM install, capacitor core, the CLI, and our PWA elements library. And that third one there is what allows us to reach and provide the capacitor APIs and functionality like the camera and notifications and things like that um, for the web browser and across all the uh, iOS platforms, a, uh, Android, etc. So we've added that and that's been installed into our project. And then we're going to run npx cap init. And this will ask us a, just a couple questions to get the application started. And for this uh, app name, we can call it whatever we want. Let's call it conf app. And then it prompts us for the app package ID. And this one is really important. You'll recognize the, if you're familiar with Cordova, you'll recognize um, what this is meant to be. And it's your unique app ID or package ID. It has a lot of different terminology and names depending on the platform, but it's the unique identifier um, globally for your application. So typically we use um, company name dot app. So it could be com dot dot ionic dot conference or something similar to that. So in this case, we'll just go with io dot ionic dot webinar dot cap. And we'll see where this actually plays and how it gets deployed into your iOS and Android code base in just a moment. And so there we go. The capacitor project is, is ready to go and all set up. The next thing we can do is add our iOS and Android platforms. So we can do npx cap add Android, and this will install our Android dependencies. So this is going to pull down a template that works with Gradle and the latest modern build tools and add that to our project. If we look over here in Visual Studio Code, we see a top-level Android folder has been added. We're going to look deeper at that in a second. And much like before, I'm, again, using an Ionic V4 beta app, the conference app. And so everything looks normal there, right? We have our source code folder. Um, we have a new capacitor config file, which, once again, does a, a bunch of our configuration. We'll just kind of lightly touch on this today. But here's our app ID that we configured in our app name, for example. And while we're also here, we can add iOS. So this is much like this is the Android command added the Android project. This is going to pull in a bunch of iOS dependencies. And so we'll have a standalone iOS project that our native team can work with separately. And we can p bring in our plugins and manage it a lot easier than our Cordova predecessor. So we see over here, there's also a top level iOS folder added. And before with Cordova, it would be part of the build artifact and a li little bit more difficult to work with. But here they're first class citizens, meaning any other platform we add, it could be Electron, it could be any other platform that comes up down the line, will have its own really separate code base within your entire application code base. So we're going to be adding the camera API to, to this. And one thing that hasn't changed, because these are unique and specific to the mobile platforms themselves, are the permissions that we need to prompt our users for. And you look this up through our documentation or the official iOS or Android documentation for this, but we have to add permissions for the camera if we're going to integrate that. So we can look at that first. Um, and what's, again, let's take a look at what the iOS and Android folders, what they look like. Because before, you'll recognize, because this is set up for Cordova, we typically would use the config XML file to, contri to configure everything. All of our preferences, the icon and splash screens, and things like that. And then our permissions would be down here, typically, and whatever plugins we're using. But with Capacitor, again, we're going right into using the native platform tooling. So in this case, it's a real Xcode project. And we can certainly use Xcode and Android Studio to 
you know, change and set these permissions and other features. But for the, you know, for the sake of this, I think it's a little easier just to dive into um, the files themselves. So and here it's under app, app again, and info.plist is where we, I'm going to configure that or collapse that. That's where we configure our, our permissions. And this is really what Cordova was doing behind the scenes the whole time, updating, to, you know, taking that abstracted config XML file and transforming and updating this um, iOS info plist file for your permissions, for example. So what, what's really nice is um, the permission we need for the camera in this case is the NS camera usage description. Um, and this is, we'll see this on my I iPhone in just a moment. It'll prompt the user to allow the camera access with whatever string we put here. So we'll say, okay, we wanna be able to take photos and videos. Um, Capacitor, you see there's a few other automatically configured um, permissions such as geolocation. Um, capacitor at the moment, and again, this is a beta project so it could change, but right now the standard iOS and Android templates give you these permissions pre-configured for you, and you can always remove them or add them as you see fit. So in this case, we don't need to add the camera one, it's already here, but I wanted to point out that it's under the, we go directly to the info.plist file. And then for Android, very, very similar type of situation, right? We have app, it's just a little bit different file structure, of course, source and main. And then the file that, that we care about here is Android manifest.xml. So much like config XML, that is um, uh, an XML file. And you'll notice here, um, for example, I, I didn't point it on the other one, but the package name has been set and that is available and set in both of them globally. And then if we scroll down a little bit, we'll see the permissions. So this is the user's permission tag with again, the camera. And really this line here is what we need for camera access. Um, it's again, it's pre-configured for file access, these next two and some geolocation APIs, which is really nice out of the box. So next we want to add the, well, let's actually add the local notifications and then the camera code and see this running across all three iOS, Android and web. And to do that, we can actually use we can actually develop and debug on a real device. So we're gonna do that next. Really excited. I have my iPhone connected to my Mac computer here. We're going to develop and make some of these changes and actually run this on my real device and see how that works. Okay, to develop and debug on my iPhone, I'm gonna run I Ionic Cap run iOS-L, which will show us the logs in a, really, in a second. I'm really excited about this part. We can see them in Xcode in this case. So this is going to launch Xcode, right? And this is where we were talking about, um, in difference to Cordova, we're actually embracing the native platform tooling. And there's only a few things to really know to note here. Um, this is the app app settings, right? And you'll notice the bundle identifier is that app ID that we set before and the, the app name. We manage our signing, which is just, you know, you, you select your team and a certificate and profile is automatically managed for you. So fairly straightforward. And we had looked at the info.plist in Visual Studio Code. Well, under the info tab, these are the same permissions that we had showed before. And I can actually right click and do show raw keys and values. And you'll recognize some of those, including NS camera usage description. So you don't have to manage and configure permissions and other settings through here. You can do it through the files themselves that are, um, you know, this is just a GUI on top of those. Um, the only other real thing to do is press the play button, you know, select my iPhone in this case or a simulator. And we're just going to run it off my real iPhone and start debugging. So I'm going to hit play. And that's going to build the app and start to deploy it to the phone. So it's installing it. And we'll start running it. So you notice down here in the log window, something really neat that I'm, I'm absolutely excited about is all the lightning bolt logging there is from Capacitor. All of these are console.log basically the JavaScript logging that you might do in your app, messages coming up. So what's really powerful about this is we can, as we're debugging our applications, we can drop in our own logging. 
if there is issues with a native plugin, you're going to see full logs here versus before with Cordova, you had a little bit of a black box. We might have crashes or other issues when you start running your Ionic or hybrid app on your device. And this really is, is, you know, changing the game in terms of local development and iterations being able to move a lot faster. So you see that we have the app on my device here. Let's switch back to Visual Studio Code and take a look at the login.ts page. We're going to add this functionality, the local notifications. So you'll see up here I've added the capacitor and, and plugins APIs from Capacitor Core, and that gives us the main functionality for these APIs and specifically the no local notifications. And then scrolling down, we have our on login. We have our on login event that's hooked up to the login button. And what we've done down here is added our capacitor code. And a couple thing to, things to mention is again, capacitor is under beta, it's under active development. And so we do have a thing, a few elements to the APIs that are still need to be developed. And in this case, this is um, what happens with the local notifications. We have um, PWA and web support coming for them, but as of right now in November 2018, it's not available. So what we're gonna do is if they are available, we're gonna show them, which is currently on mobile. Um, and if not, then we'll show a toast message. And that's sometimes, whether it's Cordova, Capacitor, or Beyond, that is sometimes the reality of um, the native plugins and different platform support, where maybe something still is under active development or isn't available yet. Your team, because it's open source, can help contribute to Capacitor and build out um, any missing functionality, or from a UX perspective, we can get creative and define a slightly different path. In this case, we'll use Toast Messages for the web. Um, so let's see what this show local notification method looks like. Let's scroll down a little bit. It's fairly straightforward. We tie into the capacitor plugins um, namespace and pull out local notifications. And then there's a schedule method. And what this does is take an array of notifications that we want to fire out on the local device. And we're just saying basically a uh, title of welcome and body. Time to update your profile picture. And what we'll do is we'll schedule this out for three seconds or so after the user logs in. And another thing to mention is the action type IDs. And that's just unique to the local notification model, not necessarily a capacitor. Um, we have our open account page action. And if we scroll up here, there's a couple other little things to cover. Um, in our constructor, we're calling a configure local notifications method. And what we need to do is register these action types and add a listener. And you'll notice this is the same ID for the types here. And this one is particularly just relating to opening up um, the account page when the user taps on the notification. And what'll happen is this listener, looking for the local notification action performed event, will fire when the user taps on the notification. And again, if we had a bunch of different actions and different notification types, this would be the function where we inspect those notification details, this object coming in, and perform different behavior and different logic based on that. This is a really simple example, so we're not going to have any really inspect the notification. Right here, we'll just navigate to the account page. And you'll notice this is just the Angular router function, um, navigate by URL, nothing custom, that's just part of Angular. If you had any other framework that you were building with, you would navigate with um, whatever, however they um, do that with that particular framework, right? And then last but not least, again, we're saying if, if it's not available, then show the toast method. It, and what's kind of neat about capacitor is we have a bunch of these helper functions that ship as part of the core APIs, such as is plugin available. And as you'll notice, there's nothing specific to iOS, Android, the web, Electron at all with this code. It's one code base and it's abstract enough away where we're not putting in ugly hacks to detect what type of device, what platform we're running on. Um, we have these nice APIs and helper functions that allow us to, to write clean code and still maintain that one code base that we like to talk about. Um, we have the toast mess message down here, and then I'm going to run this on my device. 
but this is also a pretty straightforward API. We just call toast.show and provide the similar text message that should pop up. We'll see this on the PWA side of the app. And a duration of short or long, basically the time frame to show and how much to show the toast message. So looking over at the app, I'm going to go to the login page. And again, this is not hooked up to any back end, so I'll just type in any old username as well as password, and let's log in. And as you see, we're going to get prompted the first time um, from iOS because we configured the permissions correctly to say, oh, can we allow notifications? I'm going to say allow. And because the time has already elapsed, it's going to show right away. Here's our notification. I'm going to tap on that. And look at that. It's taken us directly to the account page. And now the next step is updating that update picture function and allow for camera functionality. Okay, let's open up the account page, both the HTML and the, the logic behind it. And what I've done here, just a, a little bit of changes from the Ionic conference app on GitHub. Um, as you see, we still have the update picture method linked to this particular ion item object. And what we're actually gonna do is uh, implement the logic for that to open up the camera next. And here we've changed to an image with user profile pick as the image path, and that is a um, direct link to the source of that image. So let's look at what the code actually looks like to use the camera over an account.ts. So you'll notice at the top here, we're importing, uh, once again, the plugins code base from Capacitor Core, and then a couple items for the camera as well, for the camera APIs. And scrolling down, we have that user profile pick object that's going to hold on to a safe resource URL. Basically, allows us to load the URL, the base64 version of the photo that we're going to be able to take with the, the selfie and the camera. And scrolling down, we fill in the implementation of the update picture method. We reference the camera object from the plugins API of Capacitor. And you'll once again notice that there is no mention of any particular platform. It's just one API that gives us access to all of these different platforms, which is just incredible, right? Camera.getphoto will hides all the implementation from a native perspective, from the browser perspective, of actually opening the device, the camera, on whatever device it is and the hardware. So here we're setting a few options, very much like the Cordova plugin works of the same nature, the quality of the image to take from zero to 100, whether or not we want to allow editing, what type of source it is, do we want the front facing camera, the, the back um, camera, et cetera. And then once that this method fires, it's going to open up the camera on the device and then we'll set the image that has been properly sanitized. This is a, some special code for Angular that we need to do to make sure that the, um, the bits are trusted. And we set that to the profile pic, which again is over in our account, um, HTML page that's linked to the image here. So let's take a look at what happens when I deploy that and then tap update picture. It looks like it works. All right, look at that. Fully integrated camera with the same code base. Now, if you don't believe me, let's look at Android and the web next. Much like we used Xcode to debug the iOS app locally, we're going to use Android Studio for the Android app. So to do that, Capacitor gives us a neat little command, another one, npx cap open Android. And so this will open our project. We don't really need to know the path, which is really cool. One less thing to worry about, and it'll open Android Studio. It just takes a moment to sync the Gradle project, maybe do a build, but there's really not too much we need to know here. We just have to go over here to the play button, select my Android device that's connected to my laptop, and hit OK. Okay, you see that that did take a second to 
build the project and install the APK on in my device, but here we go, here's the app. Let's see how it works. Okay, we have the iOS and the Android experience down pat, but what does the web side of things look like? Well, I like to use Ionic Serve for local debugging and showing off the website. So let's run that. This will run uh, an IOC build command that builds the app and deploys it to a local web server at our local host. Okay, if we once again go over to our account signup and we say hello and log in. You'll notice now down at the bottom of the page, we have our toast notification because again, for the web, we have that implemented instead of the local notifications for now. So that reminds us to go to the account page and update our profile picture. So let's try that update picture again. Nice, there we go. It is updated. Let's try the picture button. <laughs> and that's another silly picture of me. So if we look at that, we've achieved iOS, Android, and the web with just one code base, all with capacitors, APIs, and plugins. Pretty neat. All right, that was our capacitor demo where we integrated the camera, local notifications, and toast messages, and updated the Ionic demo conference app to reach iOS, Android, and the web. Really exciting stuff. I hope you agree. And just a little bit, a couple more things to touch on here. So if you need more functionality besides what I've showed today, there's many more APIs that Capacitor has available today, um, including the geolocation, file plugins. There's a, a variety, much like Cordova has, of common plugin functionality that is, again, available right now. And if there is something that, especially from the Cordova side of things, that you do find is missing, don't worry about it. We are backwards compatible with a majority of the Cordova plugins available today. And if you have native talent on your team and want to take a stab at writing your own plugins for Capacitor, that's very possible. We have tooling built in, much like the tooling that generated the iOS and Android projects for us. We have a, a variety of CLI commands that'll generate the plugin templates for you. And really easy to get started with that. Check out our documentation for more about that. Just a quick Capacitor and Cordova recap. So again, Cordova has a great legacy. It's production ready and has been for a long time, and it is a very stable and compelling option for dev teams today. Capacitor is our reimagining of Cordova with updated native tooling and the capacity to reach not only our mobile platforms, but the web as well and desktop. In terms of configuration style, again, Cordova is more of an abstracted approach. You have the config.xml file that defines custom XML that mag automatically ties back to whatever native platform and gets configured over to that when you build and deploy your app. Versus with Capacitor, we're leaning into each platform. Every platform will use whatever their tooling is for configuration and local debugging and certificates and everything like that. And that includes info.plist for iOS and Android Manifest for Android Studio. In terms of native platform control, so Cordova is a little bit more limited because again, we're using that abstracted configuration and you're really not meant to touch the build artifacts the native solutions that get generated with that. Versus with Capacitor, we're, we're leaning and going all in on that. So teams can, working with their native teams, can absolutely go off and build their own plugins and add more native functionality that they might want, or not at all. You can always just use web technology and Ionic and Angular and other frameworks to build fully featured apps. In terms of whether these are production ready. Of course, as I mentioned, Cordova has been for a long time. It's stable, it's on, there is lots of ongoing maintenance being added. And as for Capacitor, we're still in, we still are in beta, 
But coming soon, we will be unveiling version 1.0. Just to touch on some of the resources today. So the capacitor documentation, how-to guides, etc. live at capacitor.ionicframework.com. And the source code's available online, open, open source, on GitHub. Both my demo code today, you can go and find that and run that yourself. And if you want to give back to our new runtime, maybe file some issues, maybe contribute some new features, feel free to go ahead. Um, all of these links and the recording of the webinar will be emailed out after the presentation. And for those that are interested in building Ionic apps and teams, we do have enterprise support packages for Cordova and Capacitor available today. Please just reply to me over email when we send out the links and we'll get something set up. Thank you. That was the presentation. We're really excited to have shown off Capacitor for you today. And now joining me is Max Lynch, the CEO of Ionic, for some Q&A. Hello. Max. All right. Hey, Max, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. You are live. Welcome. Do you want to give a brief introduction and you know share some thoughts with us? Uh, sure. So um, I'm the uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of Ionic. Um, so I was involved in the very early code base of Ionic 1. I don't think any of my code is actually in Ionic framework today, um, but I, I uh, essentially created Capacitor. Uh, that was a project that um, we decided to take on kind of the end of last year, early this year for a lot of reasons. And, and, and perhaps the biggest being that Ionic is kind of evolving from um, only focusing on iOS and Android to focusing now on uh, the web, progressive web apps, Electron, uh, really becoming more of a multi-platform approach. And, and uh, we felt like the time was right to kind of take all the lessons we had learned building ionic working with cordova etc and and uh be a little opinionated about where we go from here and bring something in-house that we can kind of manage more closely and and uh, uh couple more tightly with ionic so uh kind of the reason we we ended up building capacitor and um we've been a little bit slow about releasing it and growing it because cordova works really well and we we don't really see the need to push even more changes on people when um, you know they're 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 doing just fine. We we want to give people an, another alternative, uh, have uh, resources for them to learn how to do similar things in Cordova, but with Capacitor instead, and build something that's going to be stable and, and endure for a while. So we're in no rush, um, as Matt said. 1.0 is just around the corner, and we don't anticipate many breaking changes from from what's there right now. So uh, pretty safe time to, to start using it. Uh, but that's that's the really quick, really quick intro and kind of overview of Bionic. Yeah, awesome, Max. Thank you very much. We've got a lot of great questions we're going to start getting to. And just a really quick note for everyone. Um, it looks like a few a few folks did have some audio video issue. Uh, it, um, issues, excuse me. Um, but no worries. We do always send out this recording after uh, we are done today. So you'll be able to watch this and um, download it and watch it on, on your own time. So um, if anything, any of those issues continue, it should be okay now. But if anything uh, continues, we'll um, be emailing, emailing that out. Um, so joining us as well as Stephen from our marketing team. Stephen, you want to start us off with our first questions? Uh, sure. Um... So do we have any plans to support Windows Surface devices? Um, I see a few questions on here about Windows and- Yeah, U UWP, yeah. Um, so the answer is maybe. Uh, I think it's it's been clearly, uh, it's been uh, asked for quite a bit. So that's, it's good for us to hear from you guys in the community that it's something you're interested in. Our initial approach is that we're going to target Windows indirectly by focusing on uh, Electron. So uh, you'll be able to target Electron and then you can turn around and deploy those apps to 
Windows. So that's that's not a full UWP solution, but that's what we're going to do first. That's what's in there right now. Uh, we'll probably get to Windows um, sometime before 2.0. Right. Um, we're also go ahead, Stephen. Yep, I was going to say, is uh, is the capacitor platform already integrated with Ionic Pro deploy and package? Um, <clears throat> uh, not yet, but it will be soon. So, but that's that's coming. That'll that'll come quickly after the 1.0 release. Yeah, uh, it's not quite in there yet. And then another uh, user had a question asking if they can use Ionic alongside uh, their existing Cordova plugins and slowly migrate over. Uh, use Ionic alongside and Ionic Cordova. Core. They're asking that. Do they mean capacitor core? Potentially. Um, anyways, so so I'll answer the question that I think you're asking. Um, yeah. Can you use capacitor alongside existing Cordova plugins? Yes. So we have, uh, as, a, as a pretty major priority, focus on supporting a large number of Cordova plugins. And the idea is generally, if if a, if a Cordova, Cordova plugin has been kept up to date and has been not doing too many uh, very uh, hyper deep Cordova like modifications or overriding internal classes, it generally works pretty well. There's a few plugins that we have identified as being incompatible. We have a list of those on our documentation, but in general, we're finding that most of the plugins work. Cool. Yep, exactly. Wow. There's another really good question um, someone caught uh, about the web version of the demo that I showed, asking why it didn't ask permission from me to access the camera. And um, that's a good catch. And the, the actual answer there is, um, as you imagine, I spent a lot of time preparing this demo and going through multiple iterations of it. And uh, maybe, Max, you can comment on that. But because I'm uh, running it with Ionic Serve and therefore the local host web server for debugging and development, um, I had already accepted allowed permission before this. And so I imagine, Max, is that true? It's probably just remembering my much like similar remembering passwords and other sources situations. I use Google Chrome all the time personally and as well for the demo. And, it, and I think it just remembered my answer from previous. Yeah, I think that. that's I think that's right. I think if you ran it again on a different uh, origin, different domain, you'd get the, the permission prompt. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, are we going to create a capacitor plugin for Firebase ML Kit? Um, so, so let me just address the uh, what what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. So, uh, uh, capacitor. The the goal is for us to really build a very stable, uh, reliable uh, runtime for cross-platform apps that are built with the web, with uh, a set of plugins that 80 to 90% of apps are going to need. When it comes to things like Firebase, when it comes to things like, there's a question on here about YouTube integration, uh, we don't have the resources to build every single plugin under the, under the sun. So what we've tried to do instead with Capacitor is really make building plugins a first class experience and make it much easier than it used to be. Um, I don't know how many of you here have done Cordova plugin development. Uh, that's something that I do fairly frequently, even today. And it's not the easiest experience. So we've we've tried to uh, make building capacitor plugins very easy. The APIs are simpler. You can use Swift on iOS, which is uh, really where most of the iOS community is headed. So um, that's a big step. You can write, uh, you can actually run your plugins when you develop them without having to add them to a capacitor app. So being able to write unit tests, being able to do local tests, that's a huge improvement. Uh, really focusing on the plugin development experience and making sure that people can easily add native functionality without having to, um, you know, be really strong native engineers. The goal with capacitor is we're trying to save you 90 to 95 whatever percent of the time it takes to build an app. What we're, what we're uh, not trying to do is, is hide the native platform you from you completely. 
uh, hide the native platform from you completely. Uh, we want you to have an escape hatch to be able to drop down a native code to do it easily, to treat that as kind of a first class thing to do because the alternative where the native platform's hidden completely means that when you actually do need to do something, it's really hard to actually do it. So we, we've taken the decision that we wanna make it easy to do that. And we're talking about the last five, four, 3% of your app um, for custom native stuff. We try to make that easy. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Just taking a look through the list here. So one question that I'm kind of seeing a few times here and I, I want to address it, like what is, what are kind of the longer term benefits of Capacitor compared to Cordova, React Native, building a native app, et cetera. And to us, like what, what we're kind of seeing, especially uh, as we work with bigger companies, um, they're not just targeting iOS and Android. And um, even if they are, they're, they're, they're increasingly interested in deploying web apps and progressive web apps. So for us, we've looked at that kind of feedback in those, those types of companies and have, have decided that uh, it's not enough to just target iOS and Android. And if that's all you care about, um, then, then maybe this pitch won't be as compelling for you. But what we wanna do is provide a, uh, a cross-platform layer where you can use APIs like local notifications, like camera, like accessing storage in a way that they're gonna function the same no matter what platform you're running on. Um, whether that's iOS, Android, a progressive web app um, or Electron or something like that. Uh, and so that's something that today Cordova doesn't do very well. Uh, the browser platform in Cordova is kind of for prototyping and development and not really a fully uh, first class production platform. So uh, Capacitor treats that as a production platform. Compared to say React Native, et cetera, uh, very difficult to target the web or Electron with that platform. So uh, those, that's, that's one difference. Um, we've always been about the web. We've always been about focusing on web technology, on HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, the typical traditional web stack, and bringing that to multiple platforms. So that's the spirit of, of Capacitor. That's the direction that it's going. But we want to make it easy to blend in and use more of the platform that you're on without it being, you know, very, very difficult to do so. So focus on 95% of your app being cross-platform web stuff, you know, still have net escape patch to do whatever you want. Yep. Perfect. I'm also seeing some questions about, you know, where the capacitor code is, what are some more examples beyond what I showed today. And that's hosted off of our main ionic framework.com uh, site capacitor.ionicframework.com, including a little bit of tutorials that are going to continue to evolve through the beta and into 1.0, you know, documentation around how to build the iOS and Android and beyond type of plugins. All of that's on the site um, in some form today and will be continued to be evolved. So check that out. Again, we're going to send out a link, all these links to you after the webinar, and you'll have that uh, for a reference. Um, so I want to address uh, what happened to Matt's beard. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not going to address that. But uh, I'm, I, there's an ETA, ETA question, like when is I, Capacitor 1 going to come out? So we are targeting, um, uh, technically what's in there is kind of what's going to be 1.0. So as I mentioned, not a lot of risk to using it right now. We're doing one last change. We're changing the web server internally. We're, get, we're getting rid of the web server. So that's... Uh, depending on whether your app relies on that, it could be a big change, but that's the last big thing on our list. And then 1.0 probably will be done end of year and we'll, we'll, we'll roll it out in January just because of the holidays and things like that. So that's the time frame that we're looking at. Um, and you know, this is going to be increasingly part of the Ionic development toolkit and experience. So just expect to get, see more of capacitor and, and more improvements and, and more updates over time. Mm -hmm. And Max, just a really good one here. A couple of questions on Stencil and Capacitor. How do you see them working together? Um, so actually, we uh, they're kind of unrelated projects, except for the fact that we built uh, what we've 
I think the, 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 the better question maybe is what, what is the relationship with web components and capacitor? So uh, as, Matt meant, as Matt demoed, um, we have a camera UI experience when running on the web. So that is very interesting because it's actually using Ionic web components, even though your app might not be using Ionic at all. We built a set of web components called PWA Elements. They use Stencil, they use Ionic Core underneath, but they only use a few components. You're not including all of Ionic, and they're, uh, they, they, they use web component APIs like Shadow DOM, so they don't clash with the rest of your app. If you choose to use Ionic, it'll work great with it. If you don't choose to use Ionic, it'll still feel like a natural camera UI. So uh, we're probably gonna end up doing more of this stuff, and I think it's pretty unique in this space. Um, if you've ever used a traditional web API for doing like camera stuff, for example, like you just get a rectangle on the screen streaming the camera to it. And it's really your job to build this nice UI around it. So we're taking on that responsibility and saying like, let's build these kind of common user experience, uh, UI experiences for the camera, et cetera, and, and ship them in a way they're easy to use and they don't clash with the rest of your UI. And Max, I think you built out the camera portion that I showed off on the web. Um, really great question about, uh, does the, the camera on the web capture full resolution photos on phone browsers or is it, does it max out at all, like 1080p? Any idea, any insight into that? Um, good question, I don't think it's capped. I think it it it's full res based on what your hardware supports. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought too, okay. Um, so we're, we're kind of running on time. I, I've seen a few questions about performance. And um, one of the things about Capacitor compared to Cordova that might be significant is by default, Capacitor uses WK WebView. And uh, that, that in general is just higher performance. And if you're using Ionic, you're used to WK WebView. So I wouldn't expect like a huge uh, performance difference for doing most of like your plugin work. But that is something that generally will uh, probably bring up the, the 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 foundation of performance for all apps. The fact that we're using the most modern web view on each platform. Um, beyond that, one of the changes that Capacitor does compared to Cordova is all your plugins are loaded before your app page even renders. So if you remember, um, and you're used to like platform ready or device ready on Cordova, that is gone. That is that is obsolete now. All your plugins are loaded as soon as the page hits, you can start using them. So that might also have somewhat of kind of a performance and user experience issue or difference. All right, I think that's all the time we have for everyone today. Um, on behalf of Ionic uh, and Max and I, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And we look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you. Thanks.